My name is Dr. David James and we're here at the ICEMAS conference in Glasgow and tonight we're going to explore the science behind cycling. Cycling is just a wonderful sport that's really captured the public's imagination in, in recent years. And arguably it's, it's a sport which is really defined by science and technology, both looking at the physiology of the athletes and the technology that they use when they're performing. Science in cycling for me has been there pretty much from the start, be it quite basic with heart rate monitors and then moving on through to, to power measuring systems, SRM cranks and such like. I was the first rider in the UK to use these German SRM cranks. And during the race, the riders were coming up to me, what's on ITV? Can you get Eurosport on that? But now <laughs> they've come on in leaps and bounds. The measuring with the cranks, motion capture, guys like Louis and the physiologists can then implement the training a lot better than I feel was, was done in the past. With cycling, we can instrument their bicycles with these cranks. So this photo was actually taken from one of the bikes in the Tour de France that's going on at the moment. These little boxes on the front here the, are, are the telltale sign that these guys are actually monitoring every stroke that they take during the race. So we've got a way in which we can instrument the bikes of our elite cyclists whilst they're either training, so we can build up a picture of what preparation is required, or even during races themselves. Typically what we do in the laboratory is ask Rob to ride progressively harder and harder until he can't go anymore, and we measure his maximum power output. And it's that maximum that we've recorded every time, and we've watched that gradually increase over the years. If we plot his progress over a period of time, broadly what we see is, a, is an interesting pattern emerge here, where this rider improves around about 17% in aerobic fitness, but it's taken him 17 years to make that, that progress. So very neatly, about 1% a year. And when you think that this is someone who's riding right at the top of their sport, working as hard as they can, effectively to improve by only 1% a year is quite a startling um, statistic. And the fact that it takes 17 years for him to reach that peak. Um, I'm Harry Rossiter, I'm from the University of Leeds. I'm interested in the physiology of exercise, the engine that is Bradley Wiggins or whomever, the engine that drives him to be able to do those elite performances are his lungs, his heart and his blood, his skeletal muscle and in particular the mitochondria. This whole thing right here is a skeletal muscle fiber, it's torn open, this is the outer covering of the muscle fiber and these purple guys in here, this is an artificially colored slide, the purple guys are the mitochondria the mitochondria, the powerhouses that make the energy to allow endurance performance to continue. This is a, a data file taken from an Olympic level cyclist doing a four hour training ride. So you can see the time stretched across on this axis here and how hard the rider is working on this axis here. Um, Walter tonight was probably reaching around about 250, maybe 300 watts right at the end of his test. You can see here that this rider at about an hour and a half into the ride is doing a burst of activity around 400, 450 watts for about 20 minutes and again later on as he goes up another big climb. So it gives you a feel for the kind of level of fitness of these riders. The kinds of things that we really have started to understand well in the last few years are um, what happens to a, an athlete who's training over a period of time? By monitoring in the laboratory, you can build up a picture of how their fitness changes, what sort of rate of improvement they can expect, uh, and, and how far they might progress. So we've got a sense of that from laboratory testing. We can also now measure in the field, particularly with cycling, how hard riders work. So we could give you a fairly accurate estimation of what it takes to win the yellow jersey in the Tour de France, for example. In recent years, especially the last decade, other nations, stronger nations, Italy, Germany for instance, who led the way are now looking at Great Britain uh, and seeing what we do. And from a British point of view, cycling has turned itself on its head. I often get asked whether athletes are born or whether they're made. Your genetic predisposition is very important to your performance, but hard work, training, exercise and putting the miles in will always reap benefits and so I would recommend don't give up.